doing the news. Do, 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 do. Episode 18 of COINTELPRO brought to you by Earl Grey today. That's right. <laughs> no, um, I went and yelled a lot at a Chicago Red Stars game last night. And so you're dealing with the ramifications of my irresponsible behavior over the weekend. Um, joining us to help us get through this a little bit is <laughs> our first time returner to the show, Austin Madrick. He's a oh. district rep. In district rep for the Democrats in the Chicago suburbs. Running for governor, gonna... <laughs> primarying, uh, primarying uh, JB in 2022. So That's right. You heard it here first, folks. Yeah. <laughs> Good to be. You'll be hearing, be back hearing more, more from Austin Matrick as we go forward. Um, are, we, are we keeping a tally going forward, like a scoreboard of returning guests? Because that's something I'm absolutely competitive enough to care about. You'll get your challenge coin here. Um, <laughs> I'm excited to see what that looks like. Last time that Austin joined us on the show, we were obliged to read a truly astounding article by John Cass, the preeminent op-ed writer of the Chicago area, about the Joe Biden administration and America's and past. He's time. the Tribune, right? Well, he was the Tribune. For sometimes. He was with the Tribune for quite some time, and then uh, when the Tribune was bought out by a venture capital firm uh, and they started hemorrhaging staff, Cass took the buyout. Were they uh, really? And decided, yeah. I forget the, oh, wow. the name I of it. I not know that but, at all. And it's one of these VC firms that has a history of <laughs> buying yeah. newspapers yep. and then doing everything that venture capital firms do with newspapers. Uh, so John Cass took his nice little buyout and opened a blog and is still podcasting away. And, uh, yep. Now he wow. he does what we do, but but yeah. I wonder no, what his like he, readership like numbers are like. I'm curious. Well, he was talking this past week in a mind numbing column about uh, setting a fire in the fall that they're John actually Cass. doing quite well. That's, well, what does he look like? I'm I'm glad for John Cass. If anything, so he keeps pumping out content like <laughs> like we're about to talk about. Cass was back at it this week, um, as if just for us. And let's be honest, it's kind of hard to imagine who else this could possibly be for. <laughs> um, weaving baseball and politics into an incomprehensibly twisted knot of fear and metaphor. So Cass writes, America's southern border is in chaos with some 10,000 illegal immigrants living in misery. Um, and that squalid uh, Joe Biden shantytown under the viaduct in Del Rio, Texas. All that is courtesy of President Biden's immigration policies. He called for a surge on the southern border um, as he pandered for votes, and now thousands more are on their way. And as Democrats panic over the coming 2022 midterms, the desire of their media cheerleaders to change the subject away from the border is intense. And so I really don't think they're interested in mentioning Dennis McCann, a White Sox fan. That's right. Somehow baseball is involved here um i like that <laughs> now that Cass is apparently his own editor that it's like um he's like hyphenating midterms and and yeah you, if you just copy if you copy his text into like your word processor it'll freak out at you it's good to know that his grammar is one of the things that uh the the word processor but, freaks out while all the rest of us can freak out about the content of course i mean it, it kind of suggests that he like uh chunk to this out on a typewriter or something and i, I did off. just have the thought of just him pecking away like you know in his home That's office right. at three in the morning with only one lamp on or some shit like no i i just think this is because they've let whoever the sad sack was at the tribune off the hook for editing john cass but he doesn't have a job anyway. but at least he doesn't have to edit john cass anymore. <laughs> that's right that's right that's true um so cass goes on to tell this story about uh, a man, Dennis McCann, White Sox fan, uh, who was <laughs> run over and dragged a quarter mile by Saul Chavez, um, who was already on probation what? for DUI. Um, this was in 2011. 
Um, and just like last time we read Cass, the relationship between what he's saying and baseball is spurious at best, but it definitely made the headline. So Cass further writes, as Chavez sat in jail just two days later, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security filed an immigration detainer. The agency believed that Chavez was uh, an illegal immigrant from Mexico and as such was a flight risk. The agency requested that the Cook County government notify ICE um, and if Chavez was to be released. But then politics rushed in. Cook County Board President Tony... Uh, Preckwinkle, now chair of the Cook County Democratic Party, and then Commissioner um, Jesus Garcia, now a. Yeah, sorry, these are these are local politics names that any normal person shouldn't be familiar with. Yeah, who's now a U.S. congressman from the Southwest uh, side, pushed through a new policy to ignore uh, federal detainer requests and allowed and allow suspected illegal immigrants who'd been jailed to make bond. Democrats pushed it through by a 10 to 5 vote, and Democrats like Preckwinkle and Garcia were seen as the angels of immigration for thwarting ICE. And Chavez must have been happy too, because he quickly posted bond out of the Cook County Jail, run by Cook County Sheriff Tom Dart. So Chavez gets released back to Mexico, where he apparently remains to this day. Uh, but Cass's grudge here is mostly with the media, which he blames for shifting between more politically desirable stories like Gabby Petito in recent weeks and uh, the images coming from the border uh, where agents cross into Mexico to corral the Haitian refugees gathering there. Um, and, and I think he does this interesting uh, sort of dance here where he tries to draw some distinction between the Dennis McCann story and the Gabby Petito story. Oh. Um, but but in reality, these are these are really just the same stories. They're mostly anecdotal um, bait to upset people, uh, and that um, you're just taking your pick. You know, are you upset at the you know little white girl uh, who, who who was murdered, or are you upset at you know Dennis, the White Sox fan? And as I talked to Brian McCann about his brother on Tuesday, left-wing Democrats and their media handmaidens were on to the next outrage, this one involving wild accusations that U.S. border agents on horseback used whips to drive some illegal border crossers back over the river to Ciudad Acuna, Mexico. Um, those aren't whips. Uh, those are reins used to control horses. But why would political spinners know about workhorses and crowd control? Washington journos have soft hands. They whip Americans with their tweets. And Chavez? Chavez is down in Mexico, Brian McCann said. His brother bailed him out. He fled. The FBI has a warrant. The Mexican authorities issued a warrant, but we can't force them to execute their warrant. The FBI says, we think he's driving a truck. He visits his mother. Brian McCann sees what's happening at the border. He sees the chaos and the frantic news spin. He understands what desperate migrants, both legal and illegal, want everything American taxpayers will give them. I want to go 50 years into the future and just read um, to uh, Cass's grandchildren, him drawing a meaningful distinction between a whip and a horse's rein as it's being wielded against a migrant uh, trying to gather food at the border. I, I mean, absolutely. And and so much of this is I thought at first when, you know, the news started breaking about these Haitian immigrants coming across the border, that they were folks who had fled Haiti because of the hurricane. But in mm -hmm. fact, were my understanding, at least of it, is that there many of them were in Brazil or in other places in South and Central America. Uh, mm -hmm. The workers in Brazil were there to build uh, for the 2016 Rio Olympics, right? right. Which is, uh, there's plenty of... Uh, uh, threads we can tug on that fact, but then journey thousands of miles up north as if then suddenly the whips are the thing that's at issue here. Not that they are right. in, you know, a shanty town, not being allowed into the country, sure, sure. even though, you know, because of a policy that President Biden, obviously always critical of President Trump's right. COVID policies, uh, was allowing him to to send everybody back to Haiti, where things are, you know, oh, so much better right now. But but the, it's, the, it's world, the horse reins that matter. Right, right. Well, the, the world is never short on um, Haitian refugees. And if you travel around a little bit, you'll, you'll see that that's unfortunately the case. Because uh, I had made the same mistake of kind of assuming that these were 
um, refugees directly a result of the upheaval currently going on there. But no, this right. is just residual displacement from the hemisphere's uh, most maligned country. So, so yeah. Um, I also do think it's very, I think it's very funny that, uh, that John Cass is, is critiquing Washington journos for having soft hands yeah, as if right. uh, that's the major distinction between him and uh, the Washington journalists is that's in right. fact just, right. you know, thousands of miles and that's it. Well, that's right. And because we know that John Cass, who's been a op-ed columnist since he was um, given it for graduating from state school, I, I think that's what it took to become one when he became one um was yeah. that you know he got he got his college diploma and has ever since had license to you know just write whatever he wants in the tribune you know real men's work as opposed to those those washington journalists and their soft hands right they the journos they should see the calluses on john cass's fingertips from his plucky typewriter from his clunky typewriter and all of the suburban bonfire setting and scotch drinking that he was writing about this week cheers to that but yeah but yeah no i think that um if you find yourself uh to, um being pedantic about whether or not we call those whips or reins um that you have have taken up a certain side and in, in how history will remember you yeah, I think because I think those I think those images are probably going to hang around in the 21st century. So cast link to this Federalist article uh, that I thought was a good place to shift because uh, it was also in the news this week or kind of not in the news. Um, liberals and the now robustly funded Capitol Police had cited the Justice for J6 rally, um, which was held in support. Um, oh, wow. uh, 600 They're protesters who were arrested at the Capitol Mr. Riot in January. Right now. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, Greenwald had chimed in to sort of point out what a non-event this Justice for J6 rally was, but the press had spent several weeks kind of touting this as as another you know iteration in the or or that it would be similar to the scenes that we saw in January at the Capitol. And so, um, but ultimately what happened, as we're going to see, was uh, that this was not quite the case. The, the protest started as a rally for Americans to peacefully contest the arrests of more than 600 people who were charged following the Capitol riot on January 6th. Former Trump aide uh, Matt Brainerd um, organized and spoke at the event where he said protesters would speak uh, for Capitol rioters who were vilified because of their political viewpoints. <laughs> Media coverage leading up to the event, however, painted it as a right-wing rally that caused renewed fears of political violence to grip Capitol Hill. Headlines and articles about the event predicted that it would be a sequel to January to the January 6th riot and a and full of white supremacy and violence. Um, and other media outlets editorialized their pre-coverage to cast future attendees as violent stereotypes um, and planted rumors that, quote, protesters may arrive with weapons. Um, in readers' heads. And this prompted law enforcement of officials in the capital city to erect another uh, round of temporary fencing around the capital and prepare the National Guard for a conflict. We're kind of running out of sort of meaningful distinctions from like a, you know, a policy standpoint to distinguish the Biden administration from the the fascism of Donald Trump. And I think that, you know, this this eagerness to draw this distinction had kind of been boiled down a lot to um, or has been boiled down a lot to the January yeah. 6th riot and the scenes uh, there at the Capitol. And I think that uh, that that's kind of the, the stage that, that was being set for what was supposed to happen this past week. Uh, despite reports from CNN, MSNBC and other corrupt media outlets, which predicted that close to 700 uh, MAGA fans um, plot rally defending uh, rioters, only about 400 people showed up to the event, which was largely attended by the same press that manufactured buzz about it in the first place. So the Associated Press reported that government law enforcement officials easily outnumbered true protesters on Saturday. The Department of Homeland Security's Office of Intelligence and Analysis 
notified its partners last week that some individuals in and may seek to engage in violence but lack indications of a specific or credible plot associated with the event. Of the four people, uh, two were taken into custody for outstanding charges and two were caught with weapons but were not violent. You know, I don't really know what exactly, if, you know, with President Trump not being in office anymore, if, you know, it's really dwindled. And and I do really wonder how, I think there's definitely an effect of, you know, well, I think so. a, an echo yeah. chamber of, mm -hmm. of the media covering Trump's rallies when he's still president, which then, you know, in, incites all of these, whatever new conspiracy theory of the week he's latched yeah, yeah. onto, which then drives all this. I think there's definitely an impact of that just not being out there much anymore. But I, I really can't help but to think that uh, a, a decent number of Trump supporters are putting away their MAGA hats uh, or are not going to at least come out to these protests because they know that the feds, quote unquote, deep state or not, are going to arrest their ass should they try anything, you know, and there, there, there's some consequences from that, certainly, but, uh, but Trump, it's certainly having an impact. Trump kind of uh, suggested this week, you know, that that this event had been, in fact, maybe even orchestrated of course, by the by the Democrats or something, because he kind of pointed out this catch 22 of, um, you know, either nobody shows up and it looks like the movement is dissipated or um, everybody shows up and they use it now as sort of uh, fodder for media coverage, uh, go, you know, going forward. Donald Trump and, and learning I, organizing lessons 101 right there. <laughs> right. I mean, and the, but, but this is sort of the, the, the point that Trump made about it. And that's kind of how he, he's been communicating on it. And I you know, and I think to that point, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I did kind of want to hear sort of bring up, you know, what we think the prospects of his uh, potential 2024 run, you know, look like when we sort of see these kinds of things, right? Like how, mu how much are we putting the MAGA hats away and how much are we... Um, We're going to see know? the same shit again. It, we're going to have to go... The, what we just went through in at the end of 2020 is going to happen again. And Biden could easily lose. Trump can win again um, if he if he avoids too many McDonald's cheeseburgers. So we'll see. Yeah, I mean, I I think it's really it, what's interesting about it. I was just talking to somebody this weekend who was saying a similar thing that they you know are worried that Trump's going to run again and think that he could just walk away with it. And I and I do think that had covid and then january 6th not happened and biden had biden would have won by less i still think he probably would have won but won by less but what is the effect that's happened now is like asking candidate republican candidates if they believe biden won the 2020 presidential election is like the yeah. litmus test for so many yeah. especially like more moderate or independent mm. pr you know previous yeah. before trump republicans who are now at least like Joe Biden. Uh, and that's just, you know, a non-starter for him. And, and so it's really, if, if Illinois right now, for example, is a microcosm of, of a lot of other places in the country, we've got like four folks running in the Republican, you know, nomination for, for governor to take on J.D. Pritzker. Uh, and like th two of them are out and out Trumpers. Another one won't a hundred percent say whether or not he, you know, says that right. or he thinks that Biden won. And that's just something that the Democrats are going to Biden. Anybody else are just going to whack him over the head with, you know, like bring on Trump or bring on Ron DeSantis or any of these guys and and ask him. You yeah. know? And, and I think that I some think of the folks who I think some of those Trumpers who maybe aren't the like we're going to attend and riot on January 6th, but are big Trump supporters. I think they know that, too, that that's like a real mm -hmm. issue. I think it. I think it is more of a function of you know who the Republicans will be able to trot out there, you know, and and I, I think that most of people's uh, suspicions that it'll be Trump again are built on a lack of optimism about the Republicans being able to to put up somebody who can harness whatever remains of the lightning that was in that bottle, you know, yeah, right? I mean, or, or redefine the electorate. He still has such a grip on the party and. Like when you have a cult like voters. this one, yeah. Right. When you when you have a cult like this one, I mean, it's just I I I, I see no reason why this uh, like upcoming election won't be even more close, and then 
given how potentially close it is, let's say it's as close as like Bush versus Gore or something like that. Like even more, even more so. Mm-hmm. Like talk about absolute chaos that could ensue, you know, in some kind of recount like that. Well, I was going to say, and, and sort of the the other like kind of counter to to consider is, you know, well, if, if it's not Trump and he is in the primary, you know, do how likely do we think it is that he gets beat to his center or his right? You yeah, know? And I, right. I think that yeah. for 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 Trump, you know, if he's in the primary, you know, I don't think he will be beaten to the center. Like, I think he will be beaten on the right. You know. Yeah, I I do agree with that, and I think sure. that for that reason, you know, whatever happens in a because it's obviously an open question if Biden's going to run again, it, it's an yeah. open question right. whether or not he'll right. be alive in twenty twenty four. Frankly, you know, right. so or, or so it'll either of these guys, right? Very true. But so I think the thing that has the the larger ramifications out of all of this is you know I I agree one hundred percent, Michael, that I think Trump doesn't lose. A primary because that's where the rabid base that votes is right, right now for the for the uh, primary. But then you come to the general, and they're going to have a lot bigger issue with Trump because of those Republicans that I was talking about that have moved into the Democratic Party. And I so I think the longer term issue here struggle is actually what those voters do to the Democratic Party. We're looking at a really tense right. uh, 2022 right. for House and Senate control, right? And in a lot mm-hmm. of these places, which have gotten us majorities, at least in the House, uh, a, a lot of those places are these suburbs where traditionally Republicans won. So they can only be represented by moderates at the congressional level, you know? And uh, I think that'll tie a right. little bit into right. to the news of the day right now. But uh, that, I think, is a really interesting and and longer term ramification of the whole deal. I think Biden will be alive in 2024. I'm not sure about his brain, but you know, (laughs) on the other hand, like Trump's brain will be fully working, but you know, I mean, his arteries, I'm not, I'm not totally sure about. Yeah. Yeah. He'll right. just basically be one of uh, one of those Futurama characters, right? With just the head and the fluid walking around. He'll, right. have, no, <laughs> he'll have he'll have just full on become the uh, Galactic Worm Emperor. All right. <laughs> At least we'll have cheeseburgers for everyone. That's right. The McDoubles must flow. So, okay, so we have this New York Times op-ed on uh, COVID boosters and the FDA and the CDC and the Biden administration here. And it's part of the reason I wanted to sort of navigate to to this topic was because, um, you know, you'll remember that one of the crowning incompetencies of the Trump administration was that it failed to coordinate with the FDA or to fully staff the federal government, but even. Right. Um, but this week, the New York Times editorial board wrote a op-ed parsing the challenges the Biden White House continues to face in its response to the pandemic, among them being just staffing the federal government. The article writes, it does not help that nearly nine months into Mr. Biden's term, the FDA still does not have a permanent uh, commissioner as both of Mr. Trump's commissioners demonstrated, a permanent commissioner has a huge influence on the agency's agenda and the tone and terror, or sorry, tenor of its of its work. Terror. Um, whether the FDA uh, cowtoes to or resists political interference, how firm the agency is with the uh, industries it regulates, what its priorities are in any given year, are all determined in large part by the person steering the ship. Mr. Biden has yet to even nominate someone for the job. And when people were explaining to me how bad the Trump administration had been on COVID, this was a, a primary um, point, right? That that the government was not adequately staffed to respond to a pandemic. So why then? And so so I'm I'm left I'm left really surprised at sort of what the content of this uh, piece from the New York Times was because it I, I can't I can't think of a good reason. You know, in much the same way, I couldn't think of a good reason for the Trump administration not to staff the state. Nothing like not staffing the FDA in the midst of a 
SARS pandemic. Right. You know, like that's, that's the, just the first thing right. that came to my mind is it was uh, that, that perhaps it is entirely a political move in that they don't want to introduce another Dr. Fauci, it, with the exception of, you know, the Trump wing of Twitter is is generally well liked by the American public. And so yeah, I, I, I would think that that it's quite possible Biden doesn't want to add a new character to this saga, which can, you know, then yeah. pull folk although I don't know, maybe do pull focus away from whatever other issues going on. So so look to when mm. they actually appoint a commissioner perhaps. But but uh you know what's it, it feels like to me that it, it just feels like to me that Biden is doing like this is like the stimulus check thing all over again. Like, oh, you know, the FDA the whole time was was issuing its recommendations and is dealing with COVID and doing blah, 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 blah. Uh, so, you know, they're doing fine just in the same way of like, we'll give you fourteen hundred dollars. But, you know, yeah. the guy before us promised you some of that money and that's where it came so from. You got you I got mean, two FDA commissioners from the last guy. So that ought to tide you over until the next administration. Right. They're keeping just, the lights on, you know. I'm just going to say here, though, that like. You know, if if there are political reasons behind him having not yet nominated uh, someone around the FDA, that's horseshit. Like, there again, it, it's there always fucking, political, my friend. It's all I know. Political. I know. Well, my point though is that like, like it, situations in the past when like there wasn't a fucking SARS pandemic going on. Okay, right. like I don't care as much, but right. like major public health crisis going on right now, like ignore politics please just fucking put somebody in the job right. like it's it's easy just do it i don't care and Someone. i will say that this is also one of those situations where like just remember that all of these commissioners that are supposedly nonpartisan or whatever are appointed through a political process the next time someone right. wants to tell you that because they're nonpartisan that this yeah. isn't a political thing sure. right right sure to your point Austin. yeah so the Article further writes here, a much bigger problem is the agency's lack of transparency. Regulators expanded and prolonged the pediatric clinical trials without any real explanation and in a manner that left even their supporters confused and uncertain. It's difficult to know whether that decision was warranted um, without more information on why it was made in the first place. It's also dif difficult to say whether Mr. Biden's latest booster plan will undercut his recent pledge to help vaccinate 70% of the world's population by this time next year. Mr. Biden has pledged to donate more than a billion shots to that effort, but Politico reported that the push for boosters in the United States um, was motivated as much by concerns over vaccine supply as by worries about waning vaccine effectiveness. The, you know, one thing that absolutely boggles my mind, like just in terms of scale, is you see the FDA says one word. And, you know, anti-vax social media yeah. or whatever has immediately promulgated 14,000 new conspiracy theories by the yeah. time it takes them to finish reading a statement the FDA has put out, right? And so, like, why yeah. in the hell anybody in the Biden administration, the FDA, whatever, are doing anything other than being – like, it, it really felt like in the early days of the pandemic, there was a certain amount of, like, we're being transparent about this because we don't know what the right. hell it is yet. But the, the tenor of that has not shifted enough or there's not been a good enough explanation – for then when the FDA isn't as transparent about these things, or there are always lingering questions about this dance the Biden administration is doing with boosters, when, you know, the pharmaceutical companies, skeptical of them, right, are saying, no, actually, we need these boosters for our shots. And then the FDA says, no, only people with pre-existing conditions. And the Biden administration says, no, we just want to give them to every Like, what? Right. This is to your to your point you were just making, Michael. Something that was supposed to be better under President yeah. Biden than under President Trump, and and no, they're right. they're they're one hundred percent. Joe Biden wants to boost his way out of the pandemic, which is impossible. So right, it's yeah, it, it's entirely you know it's entirely a political tactic that that he's trying to to, to utilize when the majority of the world's population or whatever the number is you know still hasn't like had a single, you know, vaccine dose, whether it's from Johnson and Johnson or any of the, you know, the right. mRNA vaccines. So. Right. And then I think it's a lot of it's driven by a, essentially a refusal now to go any further than the level we currently have mitigations at, right? Like that, yeah. that the, that, that it, it's very clear that, and it's relatively unspoken, but it's clear 
that the Democrats um, at the state and federal level do not plan to turn back, right? Both in terms of uh, assistance to individuals, right? Or just in terms of like, uh, you know, schools and uh, restaurants and all this other stuff. There may still, it'll go on, you know, kind of at, at, and I'm sure like local levels with, you know, data tracking, et cetera, et cetera. But the the sort of um, sweeping society-wide efforts of, you know, the start of the pandemic, I think are, are largely over. And, and, and the result is like you say, Austin, that the Biden administration plans to boost its way out of this. And, and I think that, that, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think there's I think any it's a terrible that, idea. Yeah. So, well, I, just, I, I, I really right. do. Yeah. Like, I think a lot the, of the other was... major risk here is we, we're, we're, we're basically like going through with, kind of giving free reign on the boosters. Okay, so you do that well. So we we boost the entire, like, basically currently vaccinated population in the U.S. And then we still have 70 million people that are eligible who just continue to not be vaccinated. Right, right. Okay, so that that allows even more so for Delta or other new variants, as we I think we've talked about this on a previous episode, but it allows for any new var- variant, including Delta, to continue to circulate okay and then circulate in the vaccinated population okay so that like that increases the risk of one of these variants if not multiple ones gaining advantages over the current vaccines and and all that right and i think in in part of in in a lot of the discussion about you know vaccines and fighting all of that i think that's a point that's gotten lost unfortunately because you know i I think michael you're you're absolutely right that there's there's certainly not a willingness to go back to any sort of overt mitigation stuff we saw you know with shutdowns and and stuff like that but but the flip side of the coin is at least in states like illinois and and in counties across the country where there are high vaccination rates even everyone was freaking out about the uptick in delta not only because we were seeing an uptake in uh in the virus spread but because of what it how how easy how much more likely it was that people were going to die from this variant than than the right. original one. But the backdrop is that, you know, here in, in Cook County, where I am, the largest county in Illinois, I don't think our, our positivity rate went past 7%. Actually, it right. was just the severity of everything was mm-hmm. was what was awful. And, and why we have ICU beds filling up in places, you know, when there's, you know, not when when the spread isn't like what we had seen it necessarily, you know, the first time. Well, and it has all of the makings of political consensus in the United States, right? That um, essentially everyone, regardless of of the underlying horror, everyone is having their um, needs met by the response of this politically, right? That, that the, the people who are currently dying of COVID are, you know, doing so, because they don't desire anything more to be done about it, right? And the people who yeah. aren't dying of COVID have the vaccine and are mostly going about their lives, you know, the, the way they want to. And, and it, I mean, this is how, like, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but, like, this is how, like, slavery persisted for a century, right? Because, it, because you have managed to cordon off, you know, the, uh, any political access to the underlying issue, right? That, that nobody... Nobody, mm-hmm. you know, because of the positions of our political institutions, nobody can actually get at the heart of, you know, ending the pandemic or right. ending, you know, chattel slavery, right? Because you have um, people, everybody who has a has a political interest is is having their needs met. I just saw the other day that there's a, yeah, but I mean, it's interesting, but I just saw the other day uh, that a subreddit has been like exploding exponentially day by day. That is essentially just uh, schadenfreude of people who are COVID deniers yeah. who've now died yeah. of COVID. Uh, yeah. and, the, and I mean, the Herman Cain award. Yeah. Yes. Herman right, Cain award. right. 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 <laughs> and, and that's, you know, <laughs> say what you will about that because there's certainly a part of it that is horrific, but, but, when you want to talk about the political consensus, like that's there's a decent subset right there that's going to go to the polls and have those feelings about the pandemic when they yeah, see yeah. a presidential administration that, yeah. through lack of transparency, seems to be flip flopping sometimes, all the way down to other candidates who won't answer whether or not they're vaccinated. And that is now, in and of itself, as I think it should be, 
um, a political reality and stance, you know. But it 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 certainly looks like it has been um, subsumed into the political order, and I guess that's mostly the point I was making is that yeah, is that yeah, the, yeah. the there there aren't any Democrats who want Democrats to be doing different things, and there aren't any Republicans who want Republicans to be doing different things, and that's right. That's how we sin in this country. <laughs> right. But anyway. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez made a present vote on a $1 billion bill to fund Israel's Iron Dome defense system this week. AOC uh, released a statement to her constituents, um, primarily on Twitter, I believe, uh, which didn't actually explain why she changed her vote from no to an effective abstention. Um, The suggestion that she made, however, that you could kind of infer was that it was the speed of the process, right, that contributed to her position. And we we have a little bit of it right here. So the uh, legislative language itself was initially introduced earlier this week by uh, way of an attempt to quietly slip this funding into routine legislation um, without any of the usually necessary committee debate markup or regular order. A funding leap this significant in policy area that is already so charged and fraught for many communities, particularly our own, uh, deserves the respect of a proper legislative process. Right. I, I think that there's kind of an eagerness to cover up whatever it was that occurred to make AOC change her vote from a no. Um, and I wanted to kind of put it to you guys, like, what do you think is more likely? Uh, that uh, AOC was upset, the bill didn't have time to be debated and scrutinized, or that the bill was actually pushed through very quickly to give people like AOC this type of cover, right, to take this vote. Maybe, also you can help us with the physics of, of what happened here. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Obviously, folks can't see you. As, as Austin was reading this quote, it was the first time I'd, I'd heard it. Uh, <laughs> took my glasses off and rubbed my face in the exasperated manner. The, the process is always the go-to argument in these things, right. the go-to mm-hmm. cover for for something I, my my initial take on it is that aoc remembers very vividly how everyone responded to um responds to the squad generally right as yeah. um anytime they take a vote that is seen as um anti-israel or of course they're going to spin it as anti-semitic right um i don't know there's obviously a lot of debate right now about aoc's willingness to govern for better or for worse and i think is this seems to me like another example of that, that she knew that she didn't support it, but knew that a no vote writes campaign headlines a lot better than a president right. vote does, and that AOC's votes aren't used against her in her district. I think she won re-election by an even larger margin yeah. right, than she did. Uh, oh, she's immensely round. popular. Yeah. yeah, It's it's the the dozen or so moderate seats you know that, that we need to keep in Democrats' hands is where these votes go to. AOC certainly didn't want to spend the political capital in her district, right, to take the no vote, because uh, I think yeah. that this this particular issue, especially in New York City, um, you know, is a little bit more complicated um, mm-hmm. for for Alexandria yeah. Ocasio Cortez, and and this was kind of my thing is that because people were people were asking on Twitter, you know, what did Pelosi say to you? What did who made you do this, right? Um, and and what I would su- what I would suggest is that you know is that they did kind of talk about it right and and mm-hmm. and and they told aoc it's like you know okay well you need you know you need need to do x on this bill and she was like okay well you have to you know you have to do do it this way you know so that i mm-hmm. can you know make this point about process and take a take a present vote on it or something like that do we know what the final vote count was your point michael 420 to being... 9 420 to 9 is okay. what it passed. So, so, yeah. and so that that would have made her the the present vote, right? That would um, have... No, I think that makes sense. Uh, th- that certainly could be one of the things that happened here, um, because you know, I, I think that there has been a couple of examples we've seen of at least from AOC's willingness to to legislate and to play ball with Nancy Pelosi and some of the other establishment Dems that that Pelosi is is not ignoring uh, what what that trade-off is. And so it very well could be right. that, yeah, that they said, okay, we're going to do this thing, which, and, and which any casual observer, I think of the democratic party at this point knows 
that any situation involving America, large American spending in Israel is a point of contention within the party, right? right. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised at all if, if Nancy Pelosi said, okay, we'll give you enough cover for the process argument to do that because that's what good legislative leadership does, honestly. I'm not saying this is necessarily a smart move or the best move, but leaders protect their incumbents if their incumbents right. are willing to play ball, right? right? So let's shift now to talk about the parliamentarian and the Democrats' $3.5 trillion spending bill. Um, Once again, the Senate parliamentarian has put the brakes on the policy agenda of the Biden administration by limiting what the Democrats can accomplish through budget uh, reconciliation. And I I consider this story to be similar to the story with AOC's present vote. Um, There's absolutely nothing about the speed of the legislative process that necessarily had to make her change her vote, right? Um, If you have moral convictions on the matter, then it really doesn't matter how much time a bill spends in committee, right? Similarly, there's absolutely nothing binding about the opinion of the parliamentarian. This is someone who serves at the discretion of the president and the party. At best, it betrays that the institutional credibility of the Senate is more important to Democrats than the status of refugees on the southern border. At worst, the parliamentarian is collaborating with the Democratic Party leadership to give cover to right-wing Democrats who don't want to risk the politics of voting against the spending bill and its immigration reform. And and that's the similarity to me, right, is that is that we can interpret these things as basically the same action by the Democratic Party, the one covering um, the people on its left and the other covering the people on its right, but both ultimately um, having this sort of same incidental, uh, you know, function. The Senate is giving us fewer and fewer reasons, I think, to, um, to really care about any of it as a transparent or frankly, in some cases, democratic institution, right? I mean, I mean, the critique's always there of why Wyoming has the same you know, uh, vote power as California in, in the right. Senate. Right. But I, I, I remember seeing like the first article I saw about, uh, the new opinion by the parliamentarian about the, uh, about the immigration stuff was the explainer for what the parliamentarian did was, um, essentially an interpreter of the sometimes archaic and esoteric rules of the Senate. Yeah, and imagine. Right. And, you know, I've been thinking a lot about yeah, to me, that To me, that's the most frustrating thing is that it's like it's like we are literally talking about a bullshit 18th century institution with nonsense rules that that somebody <laughs> somebody is interpreting and right. holding up immigration reform over it. Right. And, and, and we're and, and the, the, my 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 favorite thing about this, too, is that we're already like using the Senate wrong. Right. Like we know that the, the only way the Senate can do anything meaningful um, is in the reconciliation process because you only have to get to 50 votes. Right. right? And so, so we're already like having like (laughs) doing this broken maneuver with the Senate, right. Which is the cause of the parliamentarian being able to write this, this opinion. But we all know that our political system is structurally incapable of passing meaningful policy outside of that process. And Elizabeth McDonough and any person familiar with our utterly impotent political systems understands that. And remember that, like, according to liberals, anyone who doesn't vote for them is a literal or tacit supporter of fascism, at least during election season. How do we square those stakes with the party's absolute refusal to prioritize the str- their struggle against the right or against and above the prestige of the federal government? It's the legislative equivalent of dying on the Supreme Court. I think I kind of hinted and alluded to this a little bit uh, the first time I was on the show, but I, I think that, like, in as political scientists are wont to say, institutions matter, right? And and I think that they do because it's the nexus where we do society, right? These institutions, right. Sure. Congress matters because it's the place where we do these things and hash it out. But it is a failure, certainly of these institutions, I think, for for it to be so esoteric and archaic, 
right? I mean, like if, if you go to any state legislature around the country, both chambers have their own set of rules that they vote on at the top of every session that they have, right? And the chambers are bound by those rules and you have a chief parliamentarian who is the lawyer for it, but like you can open up the rules and they're 40 pages and you say, yes, here's how the <laughs> policy goes and end of discussion, right? They're not esoteric. And so for, for the Senate, this is why I said that I think the Senate is giving us fewer and fewer reasons to believe they're operating as a genuine uh, or, or legitimate structure of our democracy is get rid of the rules to your point, get change that, right? The, right. the of course the camp, the political capital will, won't be spent there, but I, I think that it is sometimes the the hubris of politicians of this level right. to think that the that you're, the average voter cares or even understands the process enough to for them to go back to their districts or yeah. say to their state, you know, sorry we couldn't do immigration reform that's literally a hundred years old because of some rules. Meanwhile, you know, Chavez or whoever the fuck John Cass wants to write about, I'm sure would care a lot more or the voters who care about immigration reform would care a lot more. I think that what's most frustrating as well in the Senate is that when the is that when the Republicans had 50 50, um, that was an effective majority. And when the Democrats have 50 50, it's not. Yeah. You know, and and I've been I've been going back and forth on this question of like what what use really is it to Democrats to have moderate Republicans like Joe Manchin or Kristen Cinema so front and center. Right. I mean like they they get there by virtue of them being able to hold up every single vote that is taken on a 50-50 margin in the Senate. But but we even had the what? Like 14 moderate Dems in the House that were going to hold up the the first infrastructure bill because they didn't think their voices were going to be heard or something like, you know, we, I think it's a genuine question that not enough people in the party want to grapple with of what is it actually worth in the long run to protect these folks who are stopping us from eat, from passing the types of policies that are overwhelmingly supported by the party and even by independence, right? That wins you votes in the long run. So you lose, so we lose the Senate for a cycle or two. We have a democratic president. Like it's not like Trump's running rip shot right now. Still, um, I think it's a genuine question that you know that needs to be answered by by folks. Okay, let's go ahead and move down to the um, the forces coming to save us. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I would say that exactly, but I know you would. For for our listeners, um, this is we we had some uh, pretty significant news in the UFO world on September twenty third. Um, the U.S. House of Representatives passed uh, the fiscal year twenty twenty two National Defense Authorization Act. Um, you know, bipartisan legislation. Mm -hmm. uh, the bill contained a five hundred seventy one word section mandating the creation of a permanent office under the Secretary of Defense to deal with spe specified duties related to unexplained aerial phenomena, otherwise known as UFOs. The House approved uh, provision also requires annual reports to certain congressional committees on a list of UAP related matters, including um, reports, or including, sorry, including reported incidents of unidentified um, aerial phenomena over restricted airspace, an update on any efforts underway on the ability to capture or exploit unidentified aerial phenomena, okay? And, and an assessment of any health-related effects for individuals that have encountered uh, un unidentified aerial phenomena as well. I'm, I'm curious, is an update on any efforts underway on the ability to capture these phenomena and just shrugs? Is that what the report's going to say? Like, I don't know, you know. <laughs> no. Well, there's, there, it's, we, we have to remember, like, historically there have been some significant pentagon scientists particularly in 2020 i think it was march that briefed the senate intelligence committee right one of, one of them being dr eric davis who worked for robert bigelow um on who i mean quite literally briefed the senate intelligence committee on 
the history of crash retrievals by the United States government. Mm -hmm. That storyline has picked up news even more so in recent weeks. So former 60 Minutes journalist for Australia, Ross Coulthart, he's been making waves and headlines in this, this topic. He wrote a book called In Plain Sight. Really well done. Great book on his investigation of this stuff. Colt Hart is like insanely well connected with sources mm-hmm. in the defense community. I mean, just, I mean, w- w- I mean, one of the, like, I, I, I have not encountered a journalist yet, like on this subject who is as well connected as he is. And, um, basically like he was on a podcast. One of his defense sources literally told him that at one point in time, the U S military in Mexico, on Mexican soil, literally at gunpoint to the, to the Mexican mil- military, took a craft that had the lights on and the door open right. and took it back to U.S. soil. I don't, he, he yeah. didn't specify when this was. Mm-hmm. I was hoping I, you were I, heading in this direction. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. so that, that was something that he was told. Um, and I have no reason to not believe Colehart, you know, get, given what he's, what he's, right. the work he's done so far. I mean, he's, he's right. a legitimate journalist, investigative journalist. It, it um, was, you're telling me that story this week and then seeing this wording, um, in the, yeah. uh, in the yeah. house build about, um, about efforts to capture or exploit, you know, UAPs mm-hmm. and like it, that seems like, um, such an obvious, like, reaction to have to yeah. to this being a, out in the open a little mm-hmm. bit better is it's is that well obviously a military would have, would have a a a realist responsibility to try to mm-hmm. capture right. and study that and yeah. and and of course what we know is of course that this has been that project has been underway for a long time mm-hmm. but seeing it voiced uh, and a, a public mechanism created for reporting yeah. on it is, yeah, is right. really you know significant I think the reason why this language was introduced is because you had individuals like Dr. Eric Davis briefing Congress saying like, okay, this shit has been happening, uh, you know, started in New Mexico in the 19, late 1940s, early 1950s, and has been going on for quite some time. Um, but, you know, this, this stuff is stowed away in black programs and all that stuff. Hard to get any kind of mm-hmm. federal oversight on that. So mm-hmm. I think the point of this is they're trying to now make some kind of oversight mechanism for future incidents yeah. like this. Yep. So now it's, yeah, now it's there, there, I think there is a positioning that's going on right now against, you know, the forces that be that don't want this information out Sure. to get themselves in a position to where if one of these events happens again, at some point in the future, wherever um, that information can somehow get to the public or at least get right. leaked because in this, yeah. in this situation, you now have this information, you know, maybe classified within a public institution, but that that still, like, that creates a situation where it can actually be leaked. Right. So, whereas the, the, historically, all of this this potentially recovered exotic technology, you know, was originally taken to places like Wright Patterson Air Force Base and stuff like that, mm-hmm. and then disseminated into private enterprise where there's no federal oversight and right. no way, you know, there's, there's no proper leaking mechanisms like there that would allow for, you know, there's a reason why like Edward Snowden, you know, was able to do what he did, for example, you know, because he's in, you know, that's, he's in a position to actually leak the information and can physically get the evidence and stuff like that out to the American public, which he did, you know, when you're, working in the catacombs of Lockheed Martin, right, you know, and right. you're, you enter and leave a facility and you're monitored the entire time and you can't physically remove a piece of a craft. Well, and there, the, the thing is, is that Edward Snowden isn't really paid well enough to have like yeah. a, an <laughs> yeah. allegiance to, to the, to right. keeping this information classified if he thinks it's important to the public. Yeah. But you, you'll, you'll notice there's a tendency for the the people who have access to classified information in Lockheed mm-hmm. Martin to um, really have drank the ideological Kool-Aid uh, right. on, on what they're doing. Right. Yeah. So the, the other thing that I'm going to be like really interest, interested to see is, 
further disclosure of events in which objects are penetrating airspace over nuclear weapons installations and stuff right. like that. I mean, we know of as recently 2011 over Warren Air Force Base in Wyoming. I mean, a fucking giant cylindrical object co- comes in right over the, you know, the base. And uh, m- like several eyewitnesses, that sort of thing. Um, and that was 10 years ago. I don't, I don't know of any more recent events over nuclear weapon sites in the United States Mm -hmm. since then. Um, that's kind of the most recent one on record, but, um, I don't see any reason why the creation of this office, people are kind of up in arms like, Oh, they're just putting this into, you know, further bureaucracy and stuff like that. But I, I disagree. I do think this is actually pretty significant because it allows for leaks. Well, and if any of yeah, if any of it's significant, it's bureaucratic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is this is the perfect perfect scenario for journalists to to right get like mainstream journalists to get involved on, on like specifically crash retrievals and stuff like that. And anything like this, you know, if the federal government wants something to be hidden, it is nine times out of ten going to be hidden, especially yeah. on a subject like this, right? So I think yeah. I, I was just going to bring up the the piece about this at least opening up the door for more leaks, I think is, is really mm-hmm. pressing because that's where we've got most of our news, right, Austin, is from, yeah. from leaks like this. But to an extent that makes me think that those are approved leaks before they go yeah. out, right? The overwhelming majority yes. of them. Yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, th- that was the whole thing with like Elizondo and Christopher Mellon getting right. their hands on those Pentagon videos. Well, they, it was technically an approved, an approved leak, but they still basically <laughs> handed the videos yeah. over in the Pentagon parking lot. Right. And... Yeah. You know, the, the rest is history from there. Thank you, Austin Madrick, for coming on the show this week and giving us a hand doing the news. <clears throat> doing the news. This is an independently produced podcast. You can follow us on Twitter at COINTELPROPOD and support more of our work on our Patreon page. The link is in the show notes and in our Twitter bio. We'll see you next week on COINTELPRO.